Hey everyone, it's Febe. Welcome to another episode of Farming with Febe, where we take a look at the different farms in Guild Wars 2 to see which one gives you the most gold for your time. In this episode, we take a look at the Silver Wastes event farm. So if you're curious about how to make gold in the Silver Wastes, hit the subscribe button, ring the bell, and stay tuned to hear how you can make 300 gold in one day on this map. The Silver Waste map is located west of Brisbane Wildlands and was introduced during the events of Living World Season 2. Unlike Living World Seasons 3 and 4, it isn't locked behind a particular episode or story step. In fact, one thing that makes the Silver Waste so appealing is how universal it is because you can access it with a free-to-play account. Free-to-play accounts have access to Squad Chat and LFG once the character hits level 30. And since Silver Waste is a level 80 zone, free-to-play and core accounts should have no problem farming this map. For the farm itself, you will only really need one of the waypoints in this map, and that's the Camp Resolve waypoint just as you enter. Suggestions I want to point out before you get started is that, if possible, you want to be on a class that's mobile. At the end of the day, you should play what you feel comfortable playing, but being mobile is going to benefit you in the long run, especially if you don't have access to mounts. Anything that has a speed signet or access to a speed buff of some kind, teleports, speed traits, whatever, whatever's going to allow you to get from point A to point B as quickly as possible. I always run the Silver Waste on my Druid, half the time with a Shout Bow build, but Thieves, Mesmers, and Revenants are also some of the classes I see a lot of. To be fair, I see more or less every class in this map, so don't feel like you have to play something you're unfamiliar with just for mobility. If you have mounts, it's even less of an issue, but if you don't have Path of Fire, mobility is something you're going to want to consider. Also, look around Camp Resolve for any guild banner buffs or food platters that have been put out. You want to get your magic find as high as you can, so consume all the buffs you can find. Use boosters if you have extras, consume magic find foods and utilities such as foods and oils or sharpening stones from Mad King's Day. If you have access to guild hall buffs, then go to the tavern and grab a 24 hour magic find boost. The last bit of technical chat before we get into the mechanics is going into LFG, which is accessed from your contacts window. Silver Waste Farms can be found under Central Tyria Squads. You want to look for maps that are doing the Reba, R-I-B-A, rotations. And if possible, go with a guild squad. Usually you'll find guilds like TML, SW, or VW. If you see a guild moniker in the squad description, as well as R-I-B-A, then you're good to go. If you've never used LFG or been in a squad before and don't know how to get into the same map as your squad, just right click on one of the members in the squad, preferably the commander, and select join in Silver Wastes. Now that you're there, buffed up on Magic Find and ready to start farming, go ahead and run out of Camp Resolve. If you're unfamiliar with the farm and don't really know what to do or feel uncomfortable or unsure, you can always follow your tag until you get the hang of the rotation. The only real problem comes when everyone follows the tag directly because then the forts fall and the meta takes longer and it just messes up the whole map rotation in general. The meta itself is about an hour long from start to finish. So it's a good farm for those who only have a few hours to spend because you can get multiple metas under your belt in that time. There are four forts in this map. Red Rock Bastion, Indigo Cave, Blue Oasis, and Amber Sandfall. The RIBA rotation you saw in LFG is just the initials of those forts in the order in which you cap and visit them for optimal loot. Red, Indigo, Blue, and Amber. At the start of the meta, all four of these forts are controlled by Mordrum. All you do is go in there with your tag and kill Mordrum to clear out the mobs, 
and then kill the blooming vine crawler in the center of the fort and you're done. Do that at red rock, and then do the same thing at indigo, blue, and amber. Once you've capped all four forts, congratulations, you've completed your first rotation. Once the forts are taken by the pact, you rotate around to all the forts over and over again to ensure that they stay in pact control. Each fort will come under Mordrum attack regularly and in order if you cap them according to the Reba rotation. Just go to each fort in turn, kill the Mordrum, and keep the place safe. You want to focus anything that's around the main NPCs, designated by the shield icon, and keep those NPCs alive. If the NPC dies and nobody is there or able to res them in time, the fort will fall and you'll have to wait for a certain amount of time in order to retake the fort again. This throws off the entire rotation because they're not synced up with the original capping loop anymore that you established at the start of the meta. If this happens, don't stress too much. Sometimes it's unavoidable for various reasons, but an organized map with an experienced tag will likely not have this happen. I've personally not seen it happen more than maybe a handful of times in organized maps, and I've been farming Silver Waste for years. When it does happen, an experienced tag will know how to recover quickly from this and will give out directions and advice for avoiding it in the future. That said, blue is usually the one that falls the most because the NPC Tactician Mansell is the squishiest friggin' engineer I have ever seen and she really, really likes to be right up in the faces of the biggest swarms of Mordrum she can find and believe me, the Mordrum love to shove themselves right up in her face. Personally, I spend a little extra time at Blue Oasis on each rotation just to make sure that she survives. <laughs> And being on a druid, I'm able to come in clutch with emergency healing for her when she stays still long enough and doesn't run away from me. <sighs> but yeah, <laughs> I spend a little more time here because I personally don't trust that friggin' NPC to not get herself killed. That's basically all there is for the first part of the farm, really. You're just running to each fort, killing a minimum of four Mordrum in order to get bronze metal credit. Though I personally prefer killing about eight to ten so I can get a solid gold credit because bronze and silver just make me sad. You don't have to be at the fort when the Defend the Fort from Mordrum event finishes for each location because no matter where you are on the map, you'll get your rewards. Which is why you want to kill your Mordrum and then move on so you can get credit for as many events as possible which will maximize your loot. There are other random events that pop up that you'll see during your rotations like clearing out Mordrum between the forts which can sometimes give you credit for both that event and the defending the fort event if they're close enough to each other. There's also killing the Skrit Burglar, which I always recommend doing because I actually got my first and only precursor drop from a Skrit Burglar in the Silver Waste about a year or two ago. And there's also escorting supply Dolyaks from one fort to another. If you do nothing else, you want to at least help escort the Dolyaks. Escorting the supply Dolyaks will more or less upgrade or level up each of the forts. When your foothold level is at 3 and your forts are all stocked up with supplies, Legendary Mordrum are more likely to spawn at the four forts. They don't drop very good loot, but they are achievements and killing all of them gives a nice little chunk of AP as well as central Tyrian mastery points. There's always someone who needs them, especially since they die quickly. If you are one of those people who needs the legendaries, check to see which ones you need and if you need a specific one, You'll want to hang around that fort when Foothold gets to level 3 because that those legendary mobs die fast. You might not be able to run back to the fort fast enough by the time it's called out in map or squad chat. As a note, there is a slim chance that these mobs can spawn at any point during the meta regardless of Foothold defense level, but their chances of spawning are much higher at level 3 and beyond. I wouldn't even bother looking for them before that, but that's just me. The legendary Mordrum Annihilator spawns at Red Rock Bastion on the western side of the fort and it's a giant Mordrum husk. The legendary Mordrum Demolisher spawns at Indigo Cave, just north of the fort 
and it's a very large Mordrum Terragraph. The legendary Mordrum Tormentor spawns at Blue Oasis, just south of the fort, and is a large floating Mordrum Thrasher. And the legendary Mordrum Executioner spawns at Amber Sandfall, just north of the fort, and it is a large Mordrum Troll. These also happen to be the type of mob you can expect to fight at each fort during the breach phase of the meta. And speaking of the breach, each time the pact successfully keeps control of a fort, it progresses the meta and adds a bit of progress to the foothold defense bar. Once that bar is filled up completely, the Mordrum decide that they've had enough of our shenanigans and they rip open a hole in the center of each fort. The NPCs then decide that the smartest course of action at this point is to jump into a disgusting hole full of pulsing vines, thorns, and pustules that we can't see the bottom of and fight whatever happens to be down there. You know, if we survive the fall. This begins the breach. When you're close to breach, your tag will usually say something in squad or map chat, so you'll want to be near the fort you want to fight at. Each fort is a little different, so let's take them one by one. Jumping down into the breach at Red Rock Bastion will take you to a pathway leading to the champion Mordrum Husk Copper. Copper is vulnerable to conditions, so if you're a Condi build, you'll want to go here. Ideally, you want to keep it in the room and stack on the boss to melee it. It summons offshoots that grant it fury and regen, but the regen is more or less negligible if you're doing enough DPS and stacking enough condies, like poison, in order to offset that healing. You're also useful here if you have some sort of boon strip at your disposal. During the fight, you'll see poison bubbles spawning and floating toward the center of the room. These bubbles, if they touch or pop near it, will heal the husk, so you want to pop them as far away from the boss as possible. When the boss is at 20%, the bubbles will spawn at a higher frequency, and will float toward the boss as opposed to the center of the room, so kiting the boss away from the bubbles is a good strategy. At Indigo Cave, you'll be dropped down into a circular pathway that never ends and you'll find two champion Mordrum Terragryphs, silver and gold. If you really hate charging Terragryphs, maybe avoid this fort during Breach, because that's all these monsters do. They basically just charge around the circular room constantly. Ranged attackers are more likely to survive this fight as the Terragryphs do a large AoE damage for a range of about 600 when they meet at the same spot. When they meet at the same spot, they are vulnerable to ranged attacks, but then turn around to charge the other way. So look out and be prepared to dodge. The large AOE channeled attack that they do when they meet at the same location will down you if you are not careful. You'll see a few poison bubbles around the room as well. You want to pop these bubbles only when a terror griff is near it. Popping the bubble will leave behind a white AoE field, and when the boss enters this field, they become stunned for a few seconds. But this small window will allow the group to greatly damage the boss. Don't pop the bubbles too soon, or when, or when the bosses aren't near them, because you'll just waste the AoE, and killing gold and silver will take longer. Blue Oasis is another of the more annoying bosses to fight, just because it teleports around to four different rooms. Here, you'll fight the champion Mordrum Thrasher Platinum. The Thrasher will teleport clockwise from room to room. I personally go to this boss when I farm because I find it suits ranged attacks well. There are poison vents that spawn, and when they're destroyed, they contribute to a boon on the boss called Poisonous Buildup. When this reaches 5 stacks, the Thrasher can consume the buildup in order to deliver a large AoE attack. Hence why I like to be ranged. Now, according to the wiki, using CC on this boss does not contribute to the teleportation of it, despite what others believe. Also, according to the wiki, which I will link in the description, the boss behaves in the following ways. The boss will teleport every 20 seconds until it reaches 80% health, and then will not teleport again until it reaches 50% health. At 50, it will teleport and summon the vents and continue to teleport every 10% until it reaches 10% health. 
then it will teleport every 5% or 1%, but this part is apparently unverified. I personally know from experience that that does not happen. <laughs> I know from experience it sometimes teleports a lot, and other times maybe once or twice before it dies. So I'm not entirely sure that there is an actual cause to the teleportation. But the takeaway from this is that if you're going to be a blue during breach, you want to be ranged to avoid that massive AoE attack, and you want to avoid killing the poison vents. Barring that, just DPS living crap out of it and be prepared to move clockwise when you see it go invulnerable. Finally, at Amber Sandfall, you'll just be in one big room with the champion Mordrum Troll Iron. This boss is different from regular trolls, and apparently it can't control its own swarms. Basically, if you're not ranged or condy, you should head here. It will summon insect swarms that can be reflected and create allied swarms where they land, which will damage the boss. I don't actually play anything with reflex, so I have not tried this myself. So let me know in the comments if this actually works, because I'm not sure I trust the wiki on this one after what it said about the platinum at blue. Amber is just a Trollapalooza DPS race, honestly. From what I can tell based on the times I've gone to the Breach at Amber and from the wiki, nothing really special happens aside from regular Mordrum Troll nonsense with bees and all of that great stuff. So kill the boss as fast as you can, dodge out of AoEs, and hey, try those reflex. Once all the bosses are defeated under the forts, there are a few minutes before the next leg of the meta, so it gives you enough time to run to the Vinerath Triangle. There are three lanes for this part, and each lane will go into the triangle to fight a different boss. Each defeated boss will damage the Vinerath, and once all three bosses are killed, the Vine Wrath is dead. Sounds simple, right? Yeah, okay, I made that sound too easy. The three lanes are north, located just up the hill next to Blue Oasis, south, located just outside Amber Sandfall, and mid, which, oddly enough, is found right between the other two. Just like with Breach, let's look at each lane individually. South is the first lane that goes in to fight the Vinerath Champion. And for those of you that like bees and trolls, I have great news for you. At South, the Vinerath Champion is the beekeeper. This boss is best fought with melee and is more or less a DPS race. If you have stability, that will help you a fair bit as there will be some knockbacks to contend with. Every so often, you'll see areas around on the ground with bees. If you're new to this farm, don't worry too much about it unless you get a debuff on you that will have the bees follow you. If you have bees following you, take them over to the honeycomb and they'll find that much more tasty than your character. They'll be absorbed into the honeycomb and build it up 25%. This is the main and most important mechanic of this fight because you need those honeycombs to be built up to 100%. At one point in the fight, you'll see the beekeeper move toward the large flower at the front of the chamber, which happens to be the vine wrath. When it moves toward the vine wrath flower, you have only a few seconds to get yourself to safety behind the honeycomb. The vine wrath will shoot out a laser attack across the entire room, from one side to the other and then back again. If you're not behind the honeycomb, this attack is enough to not only down you, but potentially straight up kill you. Once the attack is finished, the honeycomb will reset at zero, and the beekeeper will return to the center of the room where you can go back to DPSing it like you were doing before. If you die, waypoint and run back. Even if you can't get back in to finish the fight unless you have a mount and you can jump over the vine blocking the way in, it's never a good idea to just lay there dead. Nobody is going to res you during the fight. There is just no time to safely do so. Once the beekeeper is defeated, you'll see a short cutscene and be teleported out of the room back into the south lane. Now, you just keep your siege carrier and your ammunition pile safe while the other two lanes do their work. 
Unless something goes horribly wrong, this is the end of your roll because you will get a debuff on you called Tracked. This prevents you from going and helping the other two lanes. Just keep killing more drum that spawn in your lane and you're basically good. Mid is the second lane to go in and fight the Mordrum Mangler, which is a Thrasher. You want to be here if you have Reflex at your disposal. There is a lot that happens here. First of all, Pustules. If the Pustules are not destroyed, meaning if a single one survives, the boss will take less damage, hit harder, and attack faster. So it's just not a good time. Kill all the Pustules. Kill them all. Killing pustules will put a white circle on the ground that you can stand in. This makes you shaded and will protect you from the 20 second stun that the boss deals out. The stun is called mesmerized and cannot be cleared with stun breaks. It will kill you at the end of it just because of the damage you're taking while stunned and being unable to move or clear it off of you. The mangler will spin and shoot out poison projectiles. If the projectiles hit the pustules, they'll explode and cause an AoE that will damage you. That's where you want to use your reflex and stay away from the pustules so that you can avoid all that poison. At one point in the fight, the mangler will move toward the front of the chamber near the flower. At this point, you want to follow the boss because it will put down a white cone of safety, basically, and you want to stand in that to avoid being mesmerized with that 20 second stun. Once that's done, the mangler will move back to the center of the room and the fight continues as normal. Just like at South, once you've killed the mangler, you'll see the short cutscene and be teleported out of the room back to your lane. Kill Mordrum in the lane and keep your siege carrier and ammo safe until North is done with their fight. North is the last to go in and will fight a terror griff called the Mordrum Darkwing. Ranged fighters want to be here. And this fight is pretty straightforward. Just be sure to look for trigger blossoms on the ground. When you see them, kill them. Killing them opens them up into a flower. When the Darkwing goes up toward the Vinerath flower, hurry yourself over to an opened flower and jump up onto it. If you're not standing on one of these flowers when the Terrorgriff gets up to the front of the chamber, you'll be killed by a massive AoE attack that covers all of the ground. The only way to avoid this attack is to be up on those flowers. So again, you want to kill those trigger blossoms. Once the attack is over, the flower despawns and the fight continues as usual. What usually happens is that people will open the trigger blossoms and then jump up long before is necessary and then range the boss from the flower the entire time. This works and you're ensured to not get hit by that AoE. The boss will sometimes rush up to the people that are on the flowers. So if you have stability, pop it or you'll get knocked off. If you get knocked off, get back up on that flower ASAP and keep fighting. Once it's dead, everyone will see the final cutscene of the Vinerath being defeated, and everyone can go back into the chamber and collect the chests. You'll get the large meta event chest, and anywhere from 1 to 4 extra bandit chests. Bandit chests require bandit skeleton keys to open, which if you don't have any after all the events, you can buy some from the bandit crest merchant in Camp Resolve. If your lane happens to fail in killing your designated boss, the next lane will have to fight that same boss. So if South fails, mid lane will have to fight the beekeeper instead of the mangler. The boss will continue along the lanes until it's defeated. Then the next boss will go to the next lane. As with the example of South failing, if mid lane manages to kill the beekeeper, then North will end up fighting the mangler instead of the dark wing. This can cause the whole meta to potentially fail if the people at the lanes aren't prepared or able to adjust their skills accordingly in order to accommodate each of the bosses if the need arises. Usually, in organized maps, this isn't a problem. Once the Vinerath is dead, your commander will lead everyone out to kill some champion Mordrum that spawn around the map, and usually they'll lead a chess train during the about 15 minute timeout section of the meta where there aren't events spawning. The bandit chests are a great way to get extra loot if you have the keys to open them. 
Other keys you'll get from the meta itself are keys of greater nightmares. I personally hang on to these until I have at least 10 saved up, usually around 20 or more if I can. During the timeout, you can hop into a script tunnel and go into the labyrinth. Hit the flowers so you become a glowing orb of light and avoid being one-shot by those stupid mortar wolves that are down there. It's annoying, but if you have trouble, you can ask someone to help you, and people are usually really nice about doing that. In the center of the maze is a nightmare pod chest, which you open with your keys of greater nightmares. This gives you extra loot. So much extra loot. You can open the same chest as many times as you have keys on hand, so be prepared to lose all of your bag space. Have a merchant on you if possible so you can sell things as you go. For me, this is where at least half my profit comes from. After the timeout is over, the events start up again and you go back to the fort at Red Rock and retake it from the Mordrum. And then everything just resets and you do it all over again as many times as you want or as long as you have a commander running it. At Camp Resolve's Bandit Crest vendor, you can get an extra bag of rare gear once per day as well as bags of sandy gear for extra loot and a whole lot of sand. And that's the farm! Now that we've gone over what you can expect as far as events go, let's talk about how you'll make your gold. Once you're done farming for the day, open all of your bags. You want to do this before leaving the silver waste because you get a buff that increases your magic find once you complete the meta, and that buff goes away when you leave the map. If you get any exotics that are worth more than a gold, sell them. Otherwise, salvage everything. Sell the junk at the vendor, and once you've opened all your bags and salvaged everything, go to a crafting station. You usually won't find those in the silver waste unless someone spawned them in, so just go to your favorite crafting spot. Just like I do with a stand, I refine all of my mats and then look at what I have to sell. You can usually get a lot of Ectos from the Silver Waste, as well as a good chunk of some T6 mats. So if you're not going to use those, then sell them, as well as anything else that you're not going to use. On day one, I farmed with my Druid for two hours. I started with 19 gold and ended with 69. So a 50 gold profit for two hours, which breaks down to 25 gold per hour for day one. On day two, I also farmed for two hours, started with 125 gold, and ended with 215, which made my second day profits 90 gold for two hours of farming, breaking that down to 45 gold per hour. Day three, I farmed a little longer. I farmed for two and a half hours, made 111 gold profit, and mathing that out gave me 44 gold per hour on day three. So what does all of this mean for you at the end of the day? On average, you can expect to make about 38 gold per hour while farming the silver wastes. If you want to make 300 gold in a single day, you can expect to farm this map for about 8 hours to get that. But that will depend heavily on if you can find a tag that's running the map for that long. Unlike a stand, there are not always tags farming the silver waste, and while some do run for several hours, finding all day silver waste maps are a lot harder than it, it used to be. Unless you want to tag up and command a farm yourself, you're probably more likely to farm for about 3 hours on average, depending on when you find your tag. Sometimes you'll be lucky to find a commander that just tagged up, and other times you'll join just before they leave. It's a crapshoot, and not as reliable as a stand which seems to always have commanders running the meta. In all honesty, this video took so long to make because not only did I have to wait on Mad King's Day and Winter's Day farms which always take precedence over regular farms in LFG because they're only around for the festivals, but whenever I would get ready to record or look for a map, there wasn't always a commander running Silver Waste. And while I do have a commander tag and have farmed the silver waste so much that I know it like the back of my hand, I've never tagged up to run the farm. And unless I'm going to farm all day, I'd really rather not. Another thing to note is that your profits will vary depending on your drops. On day one, I only made 25 gold per hour as opposed to the second day 
when I made almost twice that in the same amount of time on the same class. Literally nothing was different between those two days except for RNG drops. Some days you'll get lucky, other days less so. Whereas when farming a stan, the profits are generally consistent if I have changed nothing from one day to the other. In a stan, the profits really only change when I change the shipments I buy or the class that I play. Overall, I think the Silver Waste is a good farm, and profit-wise, it's more or less just as good as farming in a stand, if not sometimes better. It's just less reliable for consistent profits. One thing the Silver Waste has going for it is that it's easy to AFK at a fort or at Camp Resolve if you need a little bit of a break. And though you really shouldn't, you can even AFK while at your lane when you're not fighting the Vinewrath events. I wouldn't call this an AFK farm, because if you don't actively kill things, you won't get credit for the events, and then you won't get loot, and then you won't make any gold. But because you can AFK at different points in the meta, if you're anything like me, then you'll probably be able to farm for longer periods of time because you can get up and walk around and come back to keep yourself from getting too bored with the monotony. Another plus is that once you're used to what you need to do, it's easy to just mindlessly farm this meta. Put on some music and zone out and you'll easily be able to just autopilot. So that also makes it easy to lose track of time when farming, which could be both good and bad depending on what you have going on. All in all, I would recommend this farm. It's one of my go-to farms, even if I would rather run a stand over Silver Wastes. It's good to switch it up a bit every now and then. And it does hold a special place in my heart because it did give me that precursor. Where I'd probably rate a stand at 10 out of 10, I'd rate the Silver Waste at a 9. And if you don't have Path of Fire and can't farm the domain of a stand, I'd say that the Silver Waste should absolutely be your go-to, at least based on my research so far. So that's all I have for you regarding the Silver Waste Gold Farm. If you have any questions, thoughts, or tips, please leave them in the comments down below and let me know what your favorite farm is in Guild Wars 2 so far. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button and ring the bell so you'll be notified and kept up to date with all of my Guild Wars 2 content. If you haven't picked up the game or still need an expansion pack, feel free to check out my affiliate links down in the description box to help support the channel. Stay tuned for future farming guides and regular uploads every Wednesday and Friday. Thanks for watching everyone, have a great rest of your day and I will see you all next time. Bye!